I love that, man. I'm going to have to put you to work, buddy. This is great. Anyway, yeah. Excellent. Well, okay. Let's uh, let's start today and this evening by uh, thanking my sponsors, Five Star Guitars in Beaverton, Oregon. If you have any desire to take up the guitar and do some playing, they have lessons available. You can book with the world-famous Jennifer Batten through Five Star. If you want to pop in and grab an incredible selection of guitars, they have everything, including this massive, beautiful wall of Paul Reed Smith's the brand new, a brand new refreshed showroom. You can get uh, repairs done in there. And if you don't feel like popping into the store right now and putting a mask on, you can just go to www.fivestarguitars.com and book online to get your new rig. So we're doing something a little bit different tonight, and it may take a few of you t- a few minutes to uh, to click on over to switch to the All Access Live YouTube channel. There was a little bit of a disconnect between Facebook and Zoom, and thankfully, we've got a great set of uh, people that are watching us on YouTube already through the channel. So after giving you a few moments, and we had this wonderful introduction music by uh, my good buddy over in Bangkok. I'd like to introduce to you somebody that I met last February and knew the moment that I set eyes on him on stage and listened to him play, got to rock with him, that I wanted to have uh, Keith Nolan in my life forever. So here he is sharing with you, my pal Keith Nolan. Thank you for being here, buddy. Hi, you're very welcome, Kevin. Yeah, and a pleasure to know you too. It was great playing music with you, meeting you. We, uh, we, I, you know, one, uh, one of my favorite moments or memories about that, uh, that night that I met you the check in 99, right. In, uh, Sukhumvit, uh, was, uh, that there was a drum set there that was left behind from the previous band that I think you play with your drummer, uh, yeah, right. but he split with the drumsticks. And so I had to, uh, I had to snag some, uh, wooden spoons out of the kitchen in the back room to do some playing. That's right. That's right. And you. Did amazingly well. Yeah, well, playing with spoons. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, well, I, I've done those kind of gigs before when I've left my own stuff behind. But I, I was kind of proud of myself that night. We made something happen. But you had some killer funky jams going, and so um, I know that you have a regular band that plays there, or well, excuse me, played there. Um, yeah. That you were sort of you curated a band of your own, and that was uh, that was the band that I saw that night. Yeah, Cotton Mouth. Cotton Mouth. Okay. How often were you playing the night at the check-in? You know, uh, we were playing probably two nights there, Fridays and a Sunday night. Um, and the Sunday night was kind of set up for a jam, but it was just kind of a regular gig. But if we had friends come in and we knew they could play stuff, we'd invite them up and get them up. Friday was more of a kind of Friday night gig. It wasn't really a jam. And we played a few other venues around um, town, of course, um, as re- regular gigs. You know, um, I, was, I was sort of blown away. Uh, our friend Brian Abrams was the one that brought me out to see you. And uh, you had Keith Shamrock playing just prior to your set as well. Uh, I, and he has um, uh, this really comedic sense, right? So it was, it's funny to watch him do his, uh, his it was a comedy routine slash uh, musical act. Yeah, but, it really is just fantastic. I mean, he, I, I don't know a song, but he doesn't know, you know. Yeah. Uh, and he can mess with it too and add his own lyrics and make it really funny. He's, he's really engaging um, with the audience. And uh, that's, that's a talent in itself. Not only is he a great musician, but he's about the people. He, he, there's no ego. He doesn't make it about himself at all. Right. You're there and he will do everything in his power to make sure you have a good time. Yeah, that, well, that's, that's, that's great, you know. It is. I and mean, it's certainly why he was gigging a whole lot prior to the pandemic. And, I, uh, I was just amazed that these, these expats that Brian brought me around had amazing chops and such a variety of different music. And uh, yeah. you, I ended up playing with nine different bands that week that uh-huh. I was there, which is just crazy. But I had so much fun. Um, you know, it's obvious that you've got a long pedigree. Your, your capabilities are um, rooted in some real pro- um, professional training. So uh, you're from Ireland originally. So, yeah, tell me a little bit about your formation of your craft, my friend. <laughs> well, where do I start? Uh, you were born. born. 
Yeah, I was one. I was born in Dublin. Uh, my father was a jazz musician and played in the, all the big old show bands back in the day before they had groups, you know, before they had four piece bands and stuff like that. You know, in Ireland, everything was a, you couldn't get a gig if you didn't have minimum seven piece or 10 piece band. So my father came from that very old school professional um, musician ilk, you know, okay. he, was a, he was a keyboard player. Okay. okay. And um, quite famous at that time. And um, so we had a piano at home. And by four or five, or four, five, four, four or five years old, I was I was sent to lessons and I was playing piano. And I just played it for the rest of my life, basically. And I did all my classical training. I was finished by 10 or 11 uh, years old. I'd done all my classical. And then I just wanted to play in a band. I wanted to be able to play freestyle. And I wanted to, so my dad would take me to see real musicians that were playing in a band. I'm like, that's what I want to do. Like, that. I want to be that guy, you know? Yeah. So, so I remember the transition from only being able to play what you, was in front of you and read to having nothing in front of you and saying, how do I learn that song? Whether, you know, whatever band, whether it was, you know, uh, on the radio or on the tape or on the record and sitting down and working it out. That was a real difficult transition for a while. And um, of course, I was a teenager, so we had Deep Purple and we had Led Zeppelin oh. and we had The Police and Elvis Costello. All these albums were, everything was new. All right. these bands, all these genres were coming at you. You know, every week there was a new band. Um, sure. You know, the 80s, we, you know, the Pluck the Seagull, your band, and Duran uh, Duran. And so you'd sit there and I wanted a synthesizer. So I, I, I got a job on a milk truck delivering milk while I was in school. I really? To buy, to buy my first Vox organ. And um, Lazy, I think, was one of the first things I ever played on, on that when I got that. Really Which one bad. was? Lazy. Oh, okay. Were, yeah. Because I, I had an affinity with, with Hammond, and which I still do. I, I play a lot of keyboards in different styles, but I love Hammond and I love blues. But, you know. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of where it started. Um, I, uh, I worked as an electrician in, in electronics until I was 21, went to Australia. And then I just played... Uh, music uh, in Australia, and um, I ended up with quite a few few different bands, some uh, blues bands, and um, did a few albums. And then I ended up with a, a world music band called Yuppie Indie, an Aboriginal band who I toured the world with. So um, wow. that's when I kind of started out, and I just, you know, I just wanted to get better and learn as much as I can, you know, and uh, all styles of music. But I always go back to blues, New Orleans. Uh, Chicago blues, anything with horns. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, Tower of Power, Earth, Wind and Fire, any, any, you know, Doobie Brothers. It, it's man. great music and it's still relevant and great today. You know? Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. What made you decide to go to Australia to pursue that genre of music? Well, um, it wasn't so much to pursue music. It was kind of, you know, when you grow up, in, in Dublin, I just felt I wanted to see the world. There was something else out there. Yeah. So, you know, and I played music right up till and toured professionally until I was about 21. And when I had enough money uh, to leave, um, I applied for a visa to Australia. And, you know, it was just exploratory, really. It just was to, it was somewhere I didn't know a lot about, but I'd hear things about. It was, the weather was much better. That was a big plus. Right. And, and I was 21, I was ready to go. I was ready to take a challenge on. And I felt if I stayed in Ireland, you were kind of, there wasn't, a, you know, I could play and I was playing and I was playing with some very well-known bands and doing very well. But I, I kind of saw at an early age that this was it. And it yeah. wasn't growing. Um, sure. You know. So I thought in the meantime, I'll try and see some of the world and see, see where it takes me. So that's... It's, it's still atop top my bucket list. I've not been to Australia and I want to go. I'm dying to go. But, uh, it, yeah, you know, for, it's, a, it's a great country. Really. Yeah. For, um, for most of the bands, a lot of the 80s bands that go over there, it's difficult to, because it's so far, it's expensive to get there. Uh, promoters and people that are buying the bands will typically have the lead singers go down and then they'll supply them with a band when they get there because it's easier to, you know, less, less uh, cost. So I'm going to have to go on my own dime and I'll have to just go explore. But uh, I've got... Well, when you, when you go, I know some great musicians over there, so you'll be, 
very welcomed. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, like David Sterry from Real Life is uh, in Melbourne, and we we uh, talk quite often. He, we have him here on the show, and um, okay. yeah, quite a few friends um, that have that have also moved there from the states. Um, envious in some ways, but um, yeah, yeah. I think so. When yeah, you I'm, you talk to Melbourne, and particularly Melbourne, where I where I live, I put all over Australia, but Melbourne I was based in. Uh, okay, in ten, nine nine years or so, in ten years, but. Um, that city is very multicultural and it has great food uh, and it has a great live music scene, you know. Um, well, at least it had until the kind of mid 90s. Um, then the casinos come in, a lot of places that had live music, changed our stage to put the machines in because there was going to make more money. It was quite sad. Sure. Uh, it was a, there was a huge break in the music kind of scene and culture at that time. Because, uh, Interesting. But yeah. you, hmm, it was a great place to go out and see and hear live music seven nights a week for a long time. You know, there, I, there were, I mean, you, you talked about the culture and, you know, great live scene, great music, great food. That's certainly the way it is where you're at right now. How long were you uh, traveling before you decided to go to Thailand? Well, um, yes, you're, and, and you're right. Um, Thailand is quite similar, strangely enough, to, to Melbourne, particularly uh, as opposed to other states and cities in, in Australia because it's got that melting pot feel to it. And Thai people love music. Yeah. Uh, they have traditional music like we do in Ireland. So I kind of felt quite at home here also. Um, the, they have a great live music scene and the, the, the Thai bars have Thai music. They have their own scene. They have their own indie scene. They have their own rock scene. And, um, and just about every bar and restaurant has a, has a singer or a duo playing music. And then there's a lot of uh, Thai music venues. Um, so it's a huge, huge music industry here. For us farmers, there's less places for us to play. Because, okay. you know, the local places have, they really relate to local musicians and lo in the local language. You know, sure. I don't sing in Thai. Um, whilst I work with a lot of Thai musicians in the recording industry, um, and I have Thai musicians in my band, um, and that I work for, uh, work with on different projects. So, uh, but there is, for foreigners, it's a misconception. People think they, they'll come to Thailand and they can play everywhere. There's a lot of places. But actually, when you look at it for us, there's less places for us to play. So in the early days, you would come here and you would find a place that had some foreigners and Thai people going to. And then you would make it a gig. You would start playing there and put some equipment in. And then it became a venue. And then over the years, people just opened like these games. Okay. But with, with COVID, and other things in the past few years, the economy has been uh, somewhat dented, and um, and now COVID really, really hurt a lot. Oh, sure. Some have closed and will not reopen. Other places we, we don't know if they're going to open or not. You know, so. Yeah. Well, the place that I saw and played with you just closed just prior to COVID, right? So the check-in. Yeah. yeah, that was already experiencing a lot of um, difficulties getting people in, no matter how much we pushed it and marketing. Um, and in Bangkok, it, there's a lot of uh, elements involved. It depends on the street you are, how far you are away from a, 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 sky, a sky train or a residential area. If you're mm. in this district or if you're in the residential area. So, you know, Bangkok's a very big city with 10 million people. So right. it's hard to corral people to certain areas, you know, or move them from one area if you've opened up in a new street in another area, it, you know, um, it has a what, different dynamic. What methods do you use to market the band there? Do you do social media stuff or you just try to get the word of mouth thing happen in? Oh, okay. you know, there's, there's several, several ways. One is to uh, use an, an email database of all your expat friends and business people that you, and relationships you've built over years. That's very, very important. Okay. Uh, it's also coupled with um, doing Facebook events, you know, sending stuff out and letting people know and having a, a reasonable reach in your own personal um, reach uh, on Facebook and the venue's credibility. Um, and also the musicians you book and play there, people will say, oh, this is a great venue because you've got great band playing. You know, and there's a lot of great both foreign and Thai, Thai bands. Okay. Especially at Checking 99 over the years, it had a, a very 
long established reputation, good reputation. Okay. So um, there are the kind of things, if you're a new venue, you've really got to build on those things. And if you don't have credibility already in the music scene, it's hard to get those bands to come and work for you. Um, like quality bands and, and bands that already have an established following that people will go and see. So and it depends the, the, the target market that you're trying to attract to your place. If it's younger, you need young energetic bands. And everybody needs to contribute uh, more and more these days before people will go out and there's enough uh, expenditure of people to, to go to all the venues. Sure. Now people select, very select where they will go, what they have to spend. And things are much more expensive than they used to be. Everybody thinks Thailand is cheap. It's not right. in, you know, it's much more. Yeah, I know some things are cheap, you know, but. Uh, yeah, there's still things that are cheap. Yeah. Um, relative to Europe or the States uh, or Australia, um, you know, a lunch or a dinner or, or going out to dinner. But um, when you live and work in Thailand, um, things are relative to what they cost in Thailand. They're sure. Not, yeah. yeah, so uh, tell me a little bit about that. So when you came from Australia, th- did you have a band established that you moved there? Or, or what, what brought you to Bangkok? Was it uh, just... Uh, I actually moved from uh, Australia to Vietnam. I was touring uh, with a band from Australia, and I ended up in Vietnam. Okay. Uh, in mid-94, I decided it was time to move on, to, and I really wanted to move to Asia. So I actually moved to Vietnam, and, and I set up there, and I was touring going back and forth to Australia or Europe from Vietnam. And I was doing, I, I got into doing music for TV commercials because Vietnam was just opening and there was a lot of um, production and advertising agencies doing uh, foreign brands and everything from Coca-Cola to Nescafe and hair, hair shampoo commercials were all emerging in, and being uh, promoted in Vietnam. So I kind of, in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, I got into doing that there and I was playing live with some Vietnamese uh, musicians as well. Which okay. Was, so I did that for five or six years and kind of established myself there. And I was coming back and forth on production jobs to Thailand. And um, then I would go back to Australia with uh, uh, an Aboriginal band, Yapa Yindi, that I was touring with. And um, we, we, we did we do Asia and Europe. And then in 99, uh, that was my last tour. And so when I came back to Vietnam, I had a choice to make. Did I want to continue on in Vietnam or did I want to move on? So at that time, there was an Asian crisis in 97. And it took two or three years. Uh, the economy wasn't so good at Asia, Asia wide and Vietnam was hit very hard. So in 2000, I made a decision to move to Bangkok. Okay. So that was how I got to Bangkok. And I basically had some friends here that I knew in production and I would go out into the jam in the music scene and after some months, I eventually put a band together and start to work in the music scene in Bangkok. So that was, so you in, could... two, that was in 2000. Really? Okay, 20 years ago. Years are flying by, yeah. Wow. That, you know, yeah. it's amazing to me to think about you getting into like Vietnam and breaking into the production of these uh, commercial, like the jingles and the commercial work. Um, yeah. As somebody, yeah, I don't know if you had contacts there. I would think as a as a um, an Irish expat that shows up in Vietnam, as you said, that the it, it just started opening up, so there were job opportunities. But if yeah. you're competing with the locals, then how do you go in? Do you speak the language? How do you you compete and and uh, show your value over theirs? Yeah, I, actually, I I, I do sp- I, I speak Vietnamese. I can read some as well, but I couldn't obviously go I went there. So. Um, yeah, you have to you have to make connections and, and friendships and relationships with, you know. Fortunately, at that time in that era, uh, in, in Asia in general, Bangkok was quite quite similar in that fashion. There was only a handful of places and music venues and restaurants that foreigners. Well, when I got to Bangkok in two thousand, there was no Starbucks, there was no right. cup club, there was no none of these uh, brands were here. They literally had a hard rock cafe. And an Irish pub. Okay. And a couple of other places. All the foreigners went there. So, you know, whatever industry you were in, uh, you would get around and, and meet each other. And somebody, and people were very helpful back then. It wasn't as segregated as it, as it is now. Sure. So people were like, hey, oh, you're a musician. Oh, you do production. Oh, well, you know, my friend is such and such and has a, has a company and his clients are such and such. 
um, you know, we should we should talk. I can introduce you. And you you really you really have to kind of find your feet and and develop a reputation and get to know people and work with people. And there's a lot of give and take. And there's a lot of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You know, sure. you have this or do you know somebody? Hey Keith, where can I where can I get my business card printed? Or hey, do you know a good web developer? Do you know a graphic designer? And people recommend each other. So it's sure. literally starting from scratch, you know. Um, yeah. But it sounds like, but using a network of expats that you found was the, kind of the key, right? So you could you could start with somebody that speaks the language and understands, you know. Um, I do love the idea that there was a commiseration that you guys could connect and, and look out for each other, even if you were brand new to the city. Um, I felt that when I got to Bangkok last year that, um, you know, you and, and uh, Lee and when Brian brought me around to these different places, even the locals, you know, the local Thai bands and Thai musicians, we went to Wahin and played with a Stonehead band. And um, okay. these guys, like everybody just treated me as if I was a local. Uh, I didn't feel like an outcast. I didn't feel like, oh man, you know, great. We're going to have that guy come up and sit in with us. It wasn't like that at all. It was, uh, it was really welcoming. And uh, I, I really felt like the Thai people in particular were so kind and yeah. one of the things I did when I went there was, you know, the, tur- the typical tourist thing to take a, um, yeah. a, a tour through the temples. But uh, I hooked up with this ex monk that gave me this tour kind of was behind the scenes instead of a, a normal tour guide. Oh, and yeah. he talked about, um, he took me to these students that were studying in this monastery to, um, uh, you know, they were, they were taking their tests and they were studying like peace and serenity and kindness and love. And I thought, man, I just came from a chaotic part of the country in the U S right. And, and, uh, and I just, I felt so warm there, not literally too. It was like a hundred degrees humid and sticky, but, uh, but uh, I, um, I, you know, it really wasn't, uh, it didn't feel like it was a show. This is just how the, the Thai people were no matter where I went in the country, which was, another reason I, I can't wait to come back you know yeah and um i, I have to say um, from the time I, I i got to bangkok as well uh thailand and um the way i've been treated and the friendships i have you know i'm closer to people here um, and with them than, than i am in my own my own country i have more 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 friends um i have people i connect with i've learned some of the language so I'm, I'm evolving as a person. I feel like I've, I'm, I'm better and I, I've, I've been given more and experienced more um, by being here. And the, the food is great. The people are genuinely um, welcoming and, and great. And they treat you with a lot of respect. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's very different where you come from a country and both of you have and I have, you, you tour to all sorts of other countries and people are very standoffish unless they get to know you. Right. But I hear people are willing to, you know, to show themselves to you. And if you accept me, then I'll accept you. Sure. It, it's really an amazing it, thing it, and it, this world because there's so much less of it everywhere else. It's so true. And and you I, know what? Yeah. I, I think I noticed that. I bet that's one of the reasons that I gravitated towards you is I'm like that at home. I, you know, and probably un- uncomfortably so that I wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm a hugger. I hug everybody, you know, and I, I, uh, it creeps some of my, you know, people out that are more um, introverts because they're like, man, is this guy really that friendly? You know, or they think I'm trying to sell them something, you know, and I've got to just say like, I'm just grateful to be doing what I'm doing. I love playing music. And, um, but you, you seem to be that, um, well, I will tell you, okay. So that experience, a lot of times in bands that I've just met, you just came on stage with your band and most guys would be winding down and, oh, great. Another guy comes up after the show and says, Hey, great job. And you can kind of just go, okay, you know, give me a little bit of space and, you know, kind of brush them off and go on with your day. But you were excited to sit and talk and, you know, tell me a little bit about your gig and you even kept jamming. We went back up and jammed and you were doing these like really cool Herbie Hancock kind of uh, Stevie Wonder kind of jam funky things. And uh, um, I think you can see the joy 
and playing and when you're on stage you uh, have, have do you uh and you've obviously been a music director for a while right so you um you you understand the ensemble and the way to sort of control the environment on stage is that something that you've done for a long time to be able to direct the band uh yes because i've been a band leader for, for quite a while and i write material so when you, when you um when you write your own tunes and then you go to rehearsal you know, you need to be able to tell people where, where you want the groove at or even though, you know, people will have their own input, you kind of need to bring the structure in and say, oh, let's try this and see, see where we go. But somebody has to call the shots and somebody has to kind of direct people. But I've also, to also to get people involved and kind of build something up here, and I did the same in Vietnam, I started a jam session. So we used to have a blues session every week in, okay. in, uh, in the old check and right? And then I started a jam session on Sunday afternoons 10, 10 years ago. It's still going wow. after after COVID. And it brings people together. And of course, I, I don't mind managing it because I, I learn and I get something from it as well. But it, it connects people. And now also over the years, it's just, it's quite established. So young musicians can come in. And I remember being those young musicians when I was a teenager. Right. And when I was jams ago, how, how, do, how, how do you do that? And guys would show you stuff and like that's your real education in music is being able to 50 percent has been able to read it and learn it but the other 50 percent is listening and right. people you know and, and it's great i see a lot of the great musicians the masters uh on youtube and they're saying well you know this is how i play this this is how i this is what chords i use and you know and you go so that's how he does it this is great you know so i set those things up um and, you know, at the beginning, I was nervous because I, I hadn't controlled a, a jam or anything before. But you just get to it and, and you, you know, those people are still, still great friends. So wow. it rewards you in yeah. many ways. You have friendships, you have people that care about you, you have people I care about, and, uh, and you get to play music. Um, we had Dean Parks turn up oh. at our jam wow. a few months ago. And I'm, I'm like, my God, this is, you know, this is... Dean Parks and he was cool as cucumbers. And he That's just wanted to jam and we played, I think, Mercy Mercy or something. And, you know, the band were in awe of this, yeah. you know, in, in, incredible professional and um, and super nice guy. And um, so you get moments like that or Jerry Brown, who, you know, the drummer. Obviously. Yeah. You didn't make yeah. him play with spoons, did you? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's moments like that because you put some time and effort into creating something and then one day you know these amazing musicians walk in and share what they can do and they're the moments in life that are really make life worth it yeah absolutely but, you know for musicians and for people as just as people you know um you know and, and yourself you know in, in all the things you've done and then you come to bangkok and hang out with some of us locals and you know, it's it's an, you, you develop an amazing relationship, and you know you you can carry that to the to the grave with you. You know, you it, can't, it's you can't buy those experiences. It's they so true, happen, and they have to happen to you. Yeah, no, they you know, um, I feel blessed in so many ways for those kinds of things. You know, I I think um, you know if it wasn't for Brian who had met me on the '80s cruise about five years ago. He and his wife sat down and talked to me um, when it was the very first 80s cruise that they put together. And so they hadn't quite, uh, the, the cruise company hadn't, I think, really sort of ironed out um, the patron musician sort of angle yet. And I was hanging out with everybody. You know, I, I just, I'm a huge music fan. So I was hanging out with Huey Lewis and, and uh, you know, Cool and the Gang and all those guys when I wasn't hanging out with my own band and Brian was one of those people that came up and we sat, and I think we had breakfast one morning and um, he was, he just kept saying from, he's just got such a great energy. Yeah, he does. And you know, he's like you said, he wants to give back, you know, he's always wanting to make sure that people are having a good time. And so when he brought me over and he said, you know, I, man, I'm going to introduce you to people that are going to change your life. And um I am not one of those kind of guys that woulda, coulda, shoulda, you know, just pass something up. Um, there were, we went really last minute to get over there. And uh, I think about so many experiences that I had there, but 
um, we went to this elephant sanctuary in, in Wahin and oh. it was, it was a game changer for me uh, in a lot of ways, but the musical part of those things, I can remember every musician I played with. I can remember every venue that we were in. I can remember the, the vibe and the feeling of the songs and feeling like, um, there was this unspoken language that we had on stage, even if we were just jamming that, yeah. I, you know, I go to bed at those nights just thinking, man, how, you know, I, I never would have expected to have these kinds of opportunities. Right. And, and we just did huge shows, you know, we, this last year with the band, we did bigger shows than I've ever done in my life. You know, we did 90,000 people in Quebec city, you know, and, and playing in front of 90 people at check-in was actually as fun, right. Because we just had this chemistry on stage. Um, the, uh, you know, speaking of those big shows, I know that when you did the Aboriginal band, you were doing some huge shows, yep. right? That, that band in particular, uh, tell me a little bit about that touring life and, and how, what that band had done. Uh, well, they, they are obviously Australian and, uh, Mandawai, the singer and, um, writer. Uh, it was an expanded was, um, Aboriginals and, and, uh, white guys. Okay. And, um, they had a huge hit called Treaty, which okay. took them worldwide, and it was a real danceable, real danceable and tribal show. Okay. So they had a huge hit with that, and they, they've been touring uh, the States and Europe and Asia for quite a long time. So on all those tours, they would always do a university because, again, they like to give back and teach people a little about uh, uh, Aboriginal culture as okay. well. So um, they're fantastic ambassadors. I'm very proud of Australians once they're on original. Um, and the music's just incredible. So, yeah, I was very honoured um, to be an Irishman, come to Australia, uh, tour Australia for a long time. And I'd been back and forth to Vietnam before I even got the gig with the Indy to go back with them. Okay. So, a strange um, full, full cycle for me, but um, uh, I was very honoured and still am to have been part of that. So, uh, yeah, we would do some huge festivals uh, in Europe. Um, and then the biggest um, for me and highlight of my musical career was I got to play Glastonbury in England um, with them. And that was 8,000 people as well yeah. over a few days. And I, I really felt uh, that I was I was part of the bigger picture. Yeah. And I, you know, here, here I am, you know, you have to pinch yourself because your backstage and on that particular, so you you roll in in your in your trucks and stuff like that, and you're there for like two days and then you you roll out and it's just a big machine that you know you roll, sure. the bands are rolling out and it it works like that for a few days for the three days or something. But you know while while I was there, I we we get out of the van and we go and get some uh, food and stuff and check out backstage at the big area, and you've got OEM here and you've got Lenny Kravitz there, you've got the clash over there and Joe Strummer. And then I'm I'm talking to Deborah Harry from Blondie. Nice. And the band is coming out. So you know I'm gonna go and talk to Debbie Harry and they're like, no way. <laughs> go straight up and shake that woman's hand. You know, and I did it. I've got a great photo somewhere of her, but she she was really lovely. And I got to meet Joe Strummer. Oh and, wow. And he he passed on I think a, a year or so after that. Right. Um and one of my favorite moments in, in, in life, and um, apart from the musical part of it, was um, during one of the days I, I was standing, uh, we were backstage, and um, Lenny Kravitz was standing directly opposite me. And he'd come out of his porta cabin, and we had, we had our in the truck. And we were just kind of staring at each other, and you know, hey man, I said, hey, you know, how's it going? So we kind of inched forward into the middle of this swampy ground. And um, we, we got talking and then we went uh, to the porter cabin and we, we sat there for about 40 minutes just talking uh, very little about music. And we okay. didn't talk about keyboards and he, he brought me to see his vintage, his roads and, and all his gear. And his amplifier had these tiny little um, photo stickers. He used to get those photo sticker machines. Yeah. And it was a tiny photo next to his volume control on his Fender, massive Fender twin, of his daughter. And I said, uh. Is that your daughter? And he goes, Zoe? Yeah. yeah. He, yeah. And he, said, he said, I see that smiling face every day I go to work. The first thing I do when I turn on my amplifier and turn on my volume, I see that face. That's beautiful. Like, That's something you don't see. Right. In the 
for our R N. Yeah. And and we were uh so we and we talked about Ireland. He loved Ireland and um had been there quite a few times. And um we we just spoke about places we've been and people we we met and I wish that we talked more about uh his albums and music and uh, I like some of uh, his music and some of the taxi um taxi driver some yeah of some, yeah you know, well, that first record oh my god you know let love rule mama said yeah yeah you know god it's so good um you know downtown julie brown from the you know uh, empty so um you'll have wow. i don't know if, if you get a chance to take a look at my archive of videos i interviewed downtown julie brown from mtv um, she's become a dear friend of mine and she I gave her her first drum lesson on the beach in the Dominican Republic a couple years ago. Oh, okay. And she said she wanted to play drums and, and to, you know, she's sitting there in the bikini. I got to try and teach her, you know, that. And, and uh, I, you bet as long as you yeah. need, but, uh, yeah. um, but we've been doing this virtually. She lives in Italy and yeah. she, she wanted to learn, learn low uh, off the most recent Lenny Kravitz record. And um, I told her, there's, a, there's an interesting drum beat to it. That's a little complex if you've never played drums, right? The, the kick drum pattern's funky. So I said, yeah. go back and you listen to Let Love Rule and listen to Mama Said, right? And that, uh, great, um, great. those both great tunes and very simple drums, but that's Kravitz playing everything on that record. He did everything, guitar, bass, drums, he's everything. And uh, I, um, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where she, gets the energy from the song and she just wants to feel the energy by playing it. And these, you know, she's, she's got these, this wide eyed youthful energy, right? Cause she's a brand new musician, but she grew up with this music and she and I are talking about these experiences like you and I are where, you know, talking about different shows, you went to Glastonbury and she goes, I said, what was your most memorable moment? Even if it was not related to MTV. And she just said, well, the MTV moment was, um, you know, bringing, queen on for live aid like oh okay <laughs> right you win we, yeah, we don't, yeah. i don't need to have any uh we're not going to arm wrestle over the the cool gigs but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah that's but, <laughs> but the, but the musical part of this and I, I just thought of kravitz because um i saw him with some of your uh homeland uh brothers a few years ago he opened for you too um, oh, yeah. and so there was a huge 360 tour that was what they they called that you the u2 tour um, Kravitz was uh, during the daytime had his huge band, big backup singers and, and uh, the horns. You two had so much production, right? They had like the the massive like spider like stage with the crazy lights and and Kravitz came out in the daytime with no production. He had old vintage amps uh, and the monitors were jacked. His in ears weren't working, and so he kept talking and complaining. Finally, he rips his ears out. And he talks to the monitor engineer and he's like, Hey dude, enough. And just winged it. And it was really cool to watch him have, you know, push forward with the show, complete professional, but you could see, you know, that yeah. this, this guy, he walks on stage and exudes soul. There is nothing about that guy that does not feel what he's playing. You know, that's, that's I got that from him when sitting talking, to him, I could, I could almost feel that this is right. This guy a pure soul he was almost angelic like That's... he was soft spoken he was just you know had this great energy about him um that's cool man the, that's highlight, a... the highlight of talking to him was we were just sitting there having this conversation i thought that this is awesome for me here i am you know this, this is great i've made it i'm, yeah. I'm sitting here having a conversation with with, with many crowds so i'm like who can i call can i call my mom you know yeah and, and the door swung open and Al Green walked in. Oh my God. And then oh. he, and he started, looks at me as if to say, holy shit, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Like it was at that, that moment. Yeah. He was shared two it. people in shock, in yeah. awe. And he bustled in with a big guy. He bustled in uh, with a couple of people. And I have, I actually have a photo of them together, and they never got one with me. Oh, uh, no. it, but um, yeah, it would, it would have been very uncool to say, "Oh, look, it was great talking to you." Can I have a photo? Of so um, Al Green is standing there, and Al Green was a huge fan of Lenny Kravitz. Oh, and, and you know, they invited each other to each other's, you know, church and um, houses, and wow. 
you know, said, let's let's do a song together sometime. And you could see Lane's face was just as in awe as me. Right. So, yes. Yeah. I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that. And that, that was a moment where all barriers were broken down. Yeah. There was no barriers. There was nothing. And here was greatness. Greatness and, and, and purity in it was all about the people. It was all about the music and it was all about these two. It was all about the, the music and, and the people playing it. And yeah. I just sat there thinking for that one moment, I thought, how amazing is that to get you know two people of that ilk that respect each other of that, uh, at that level. And um, it was really special. That was very, very and just- out of my musical career. On to share the air right there in that small vicinity between the, the three of you, right? I mean, that's the thing is that in a circle of the three, you know, you're it, there is this sort of unseen energy flow right there, you know. So you've got a little crazy, uh, you know, soul R and B DNA in you that course through, yeah, you know. I think, so. I, uh, I, I think that's how people connect, you know. And there is something that can't be explained about music and energy and the people who play it and why you can see a lot of great bands and there's a lot of great musicians. But the people that have the gig are working with that guy, when you meet them, it's not not all about the music. You right. realize this guy is a great guy. This is why people don't are working with this guy. You know, you yeah. might have somebody else who is technically better and stuff, but not everybody wants to work with that guy because he might be not so nice, you know. Right. And um, so I think I think a lot of you know good vibes and, and being a good person can really take you to some beautiful places in your life. It's, you know, it's funny because I don't know if you've seen any of the previous interviews that I've done, but that exact same subject matter has come up about two dozen times at least. Uh, I I have friends here uh, that are in the drummer community that have come out with me on the road. And one of them in particular, dear friend of mine, he's watching right now. So I'll just call him out. Uh, Andrew was side stage um, at a house of blues when uh, when I was playing with that band Animotion. Obsession was like their ticket song. He was sitting off the side of the stage, kind of arms crossed. And I came off the stage and he's like, man, you know, why do bands, like, why are you getting the call for these gigs? Why are, you know, he was a little bit, uh, you know, sort of jealous and envious. And he said, he said, why are you getting the call on these gigs? You know, it's not like you're that great. And I go, you're right. Uh, no, you know, I think um, the biggest reason is that I, first of all, don't act that way. Uh, you know, I think 90% of the gig is that, the people that are hiring want to be around that person 24 hours a day. So if your hang is good and your chops are okay, then, then you're solid. You know, if you're reliable and, and, and trustworthy and, and all those kind of the, uh, the, you know, the things that aren't related to actually putting notes on paper and, you know, hitting beats. Um, but yeah. the, um, you know, I, I wanted to touch on Stevie and really quick because the, another person who um, when Stevie wonder walks in a room you don't have to see him. You just feel it. And I know as a keyboardist, you've got to be like a, a fan of, of Stevie and his chops. And I, uh, you know, the NAMM show in, in LA and in, in Anaheim a couple of years ago, I was there with my son. Um, Sunday night, they're packing everything up at the NAMM show. And we were in the Roland building and I was looking at the drums next to the keyboards. Everything is shutting down and they're trying to get everybody out of there on Sunday when this entourage comes in. There's nobody really in the whole wing and 20 or 30 guys are all gathered around this one dude migrating over to the keyboards. And I could see it's Stevie wonder. And he pops in, sits down at the keys at about 10 feet from us. And my son said, uh, who's the dude in the shades? And it's Stevie wonder. And he goes, no, it's not. And I said, yeah. And he's, he sits down, doesn't feel the keyboard out really. He just starts rocking. He's just jamming, you know? And um, they kind of left the wing open for him at the end of the night, you know, so that he could do, un, uh, he, could, he wouldn't be bothered, right? He uninterrupted. Yeah. And my son's like, no, that's not Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder's blind. And I go, yeah, well, that's the thing. He is. He goes, no, yeah. that guy, look at the way he's playing. The guy can see his hands. I go, no, no, it's true. This is really Stevie Wonder. But he, uh, I remember that it was almost as if you had this, um, like static electricity in the, in the room when he walked through and went past us to go and sit down. It's really strange how, you know, you know what, and I can actually tell you, and this is honestly. Yeah. How you can be affected by somebody, you know, 
I felt like that when I went to see some of the temples there in, in Bangkok. You know, when I met these monks that were so old that dedicated their entire lives into sort of communicating peace and positivity and everything about those guys was all just communicating love. You know, it was, it, I, I hate to sound all, you know, like, yeah. uh, you know, foofy, but. I thought uh, this was a rock and roll interview. Kevin, what's you going know, on? <laughs> and it's funny, man, because I'm not a religious guy at all. You know, I'm fascinated by culture, you know, and that was the thing that uh, I thought, man, these it was my Abraham, what have you done to my friend Kevin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is all uh, mandated that we speak about this as part of the uh, the US Thai relationship, you know. So, no, I'm kidding. I uh but, you know it it's the unspoken stuff, it's the energy, you know, that I'm talking about. And um I kind of feel like no matter what country you went to, right? If you uh if you walk in with uh an appreciation and respect for the other musicians, you know, which is why it worked for you when you went to Vietnam and why it worked for you when you went to Australia. And uh, Do you have uh, any aspirations to get outside of Thailand? Uh, I'd like to tour. I'm, I'm working on a, a blues album at the moment, okay. uh, which I started a couple of years ago and then we kind of tracked some tracks and then I was kind of writing some more. So we never, there was no pressure to finish it. So um, we've actually started working on it again and I've, I've, I've written some more and we've um we've got the tracks pretty close pretty close now so we're just adding some extra some more guitars and stuff and then i'll go in and do a vocal so what i you know after covid and things get back to normal it's kind of been horrible for a lot of people but it's also been good in a sense because it's made me realize we really need to have to lift our game again and yeah. kind of do what we can to reinvent ourselves I have a lot of friends are in, in in a bad way because of COVID, you know, myself, myself included, everything stopped, you know. Right. So um, you got to do what you got to do. So my plan is to be as productive as possible while I can, and then finish my album and, and finish things, get things done. So when things do get back to some sort of normality, we can all get back and start touring again, start playing gigs again. Um, and you need to, if you plan now, um, and write your songs, get your bio together, do you know video, do what you can um, to be prepared for when you do go back out on the road. Um, Good advice, yeah, man. I, you know, when um, you be ready, be ready. Don't kind of wait for it, and then then you know, then it's really hard just to get it going. You know, but for, you know, do what you can now if you can to prepare. For, um, and I, it makes me feel like I want to. I want to get back out there and I want to do my local gigs here if, if they're still available. And um, I want to put some new, new, new tunes together that and have a fresh start, get some more stuff out on YouTube and, and albums cut, you know, and, um, and start touring because uh, it makes you feel good when, you're, when you play live. Yeah, no kidding. Well, you know, man, this is Keith Nolan's How to Hustle 101. This is pretty good. <laughs> the, the, uh, you know, you talk about being tour, going out there and touring. Um, say COVID never happened, right? The pandemic wasn't there. You'd still be doing quite a few gigs weekly at your establishments uh, in in Bangkok. Were you traveling outside the area on a regular basis as well, or? Yeah, pretty much. I'm mean, semi regular. We used to do okay. more some years ago, uh, but in recent years, um, we, we've we yeah we played Cambodia several times. We we go to Phnom Penh. We we um, we do um, festivals. Uh, we did Wok Hien, we did Krabi, we did Phuket, we did Koh Samui a bunch of times, uh, Vietnam a bunch of times. Um, and they're always nice to get away for two or three days, go play a festival, come back, or uh, go play Cambodia and come back. Um, you know, and they're always nice to be away because you're with a bunch of people. And you're, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're both a tourist and you're there for, to work. Right, yeah. But you get to see other cultures, you get to meet other cultures, you meet great people at the gigs, of course. And, um, you know, we played this gig. Um, I was touring with a, a, a fantastic and famous Australian artist, Ben Hines, who I also toured with. And we played in Vietnam. And our first gig when we arrived, they wanted us to do this cultural thing. We tried it was a roundabout in the middle of Hanoi. Oh, a, my God. A, a roundabout in the city with 50,000 cars and motorbikes whizzing past. We oh had to stop the traffic to get us literally onto the roundabout where the city was <laughs> in the middle of the city. And there was people just whizzing by and beeping horns and I'm thinking, what? 
Oh my God. You know, what, what is going on? This is with Cottonmouth? Uh, no, this was with um, some of Cottonmouth, but we have a touring band with uh, Denny, with Denny Hines. Okay. Uh, she's Australian vocalist and singer. Um, she's, uh, she's amazing. And so we, we were there for a few days and we did uh, Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City and Quay um, for their 300 year anniversary of, of Vietnam. And um, reunification is a big And it was shock. It was just like in on the road in the huh. city. And if you've ever seen any videos of the traffic in yeah. Vietnam, I mean, oh. it's really and there's very few cars, but there are thousands of motorbikes coming at you. And there's there's no left and right. It's just like right free for all. Yeah. Of course, in best west, like we're 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 going to go until we feel it's their time, and then right. they start, and it's just like a, you know. But and nobody got hit. It was incredible. So yeah, we we, we um uh, in recent months and the last year or so, it's been less overseas gigs, less of everything. I think just the world economy. People are less, you know, more conservative about their spending and their advertising. So, you know, that's a whole other world. Of, that, um, things you're going to have to deal with when things come back. It's the truth. Yeah. And you seem to, I mean, obviously, you know, the hustle. Um, and if you're really wanting to do some touring outside, it seems like you've got enough contacts and ways to be able to do it, even if you have to do it on a shoestring budget, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. You, sell, and, you, yeah. you bring merchandise and sell, sell uh, product when you're out there too? We we have in the past. I don't. We don't have any T-shirts or anything left. Um, usually, the festival will provide you know tour T-shirts with you on it. Uh, yeah. If you're on the, on the list, so we might get some of those. But I haven't. Cottonmouth has T-shirts, and I've signed up and made some T-shirts on Teespring.com. Mm -hmm. So, um, if people want to buy one of our T-shirts, they're actually available there. But we don't have supply anymore. Um, we did some months ago, and and um, some. People bought them at our gig in uh, Bangkok at Portico, where we played. Um, but I haven't made any. In, in, in I, you know, I, I just I wonder just about touring. You know, in, if you're on a shoestring budget, right? The ways to help supplement the income, if the income is not guaranteed, good solid money, but you've got CDs for sale and T-shirts and that kind of thing, whatever you can do. You know, one of our drawbacks or um, hangups, failings um, with uh, with the flock of seagulls is that. Uh, a lot of times, just because Mike, our singer, lives in Liverpool, uh, then, uh, you know, transporting merchandise overseas is ridiculous. It's expensive as heck. And so, um, yeah, I just, uh, I wondered how prevalent it is there. When I saw so many bands playing, I didn't see bands out hustling their CDs and hustling, uh, you know, like download cards or, or T-shirts or swag or anything. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not... It's not a big thing, but I think that's starting to change. Now, if you go to a concert, if Santana comes to Bangkok, for example, and he plays in Arena, and you'll have Caradal, one of the biggest Thai rock bands, um, usually will, they're, they're also very good friends with Santana, so they'll play the support gig. You, you, you know, they will have stalls. Oh, okay. Well, they are stalls on the side for merch. Sure. When you go to a Thai concert of um, some of the Thai rock star bands, like Body Slam, there's some bands called Body Slam, Flash, um, Seiko, also Asmi, and all these bands you might not have heard of, um, but that are huge. They will have merch stands outside, and all type people know them. Okay. So I'll give you an example. I, I, I played some keyboards and recorded with a band called City Fools that were huge some years ago here. And when these guys release an album, they will say 1.8 million copies within the first week. Oh my album. God. Wow. That's just starters. As another friend of mine, Seiko, also a, a huge superstar here in Guitar Player Center, um, he'll do a concert, minimum 25,000 people will turn it. Wow. So, and then, you know, Seiko is known overseas to Thai communities and, and some foreign communities, uh, but the local bands that are so big, you don't need, people don't even know who they are overseas because they're singing in Thai and they're, you know, these guys are huge and sell a huge amount of merch and CDs and uh, downloads or, you know, it's all downloads and streaming now, of course. Right. T-shirts and, and uh, mugs and, you know, whatever. But they are doing huge sales. Like okay. Like these albums, you're talking about 1.8 million. And uh, maybe it'll get up to 2 million or 3 million within the first three, three weeks. Amazing. You know, um, you know, um, you know 
I think, you know, if, if we get a, a gold record, it's 25,000 or platinum, it's 50,000 or something, right? So, you know, over here, you know, they're, they're huge figures. So, That's good. yeah, so there is a lot of merch. Local bands and smaller bands, they do smaller things. They might have t-shirts or they might have um, send you to their website for streaming or Spotify. Or they'll usually have a line ID that you can you can scan and follow them and stuff like that. So they're, they're quite tech savvy. Um, and it's gone more tech savvy, I think, in the, in the future. Nobody's sure. these people don't even have CD players anymore. You know? Sure. You know, so that, that's kind of a window. But people are, like you said, they, they'll, uh, when I when I release our, our album, we'll, we'll get cars, you know, and you'll, you'll, you'll be able to, you know, hand somebody a card and say, here, you know, go here. And Download link. Or here's a here's a discount or a free download. So there'll be promotions. I think the, the, these are the things that are going to be much bigger in the future. Plus, albums are kind of passe now. You know, people are. I, I spoke to uh, a famous uh, Australian artist, uh, Richard Clapton, and I said, you know, hey, so you know, you're still making a lot of albums. Because we don't make albums. We make tracks. Tracks. Yes. Yeah, really to, singles. Yeah, just you know, single, and you might back up two or three songs, or yeah. if you're, I think you might have a bunch, but you'll release this one and this one. And then when the next one's ready, but you, you, you know, if you release an album, you're getting one big bite of the apple of twelve tracks, and then you've got nothing for a year or two. Right. You know, you've got nothing to tour as well. Right. So if you're a band, you want to go tour. You need to. You need product. You need to put out some new tracks. So, but people are downloading a track if they like it. They might get it a second one. If not, there's so much information coming at people so fast. That's um, true. You know, the, um, you know, an album it doesn't really make so much sense anymore. That's, so, yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad that you catch that. I, uh, I'm wondering, um, I saw the Hammond shirt there. Are you endorsed by Hammond? I'm not, no. We, I uh, wish I was. Not yet. No, but, they, uh, but it's good promotion, though. And now that you wear that, hopefully somebody in the marketing is seeing that. And they're going to, uh, um, would, uh, would you be comfortable at all? Maybe playing me a track off your new record? Playing live? Uh, oh, live? Yeah. Uh, you were doing a little warm up when we had this, and I thought, man, it'd be cool to hear you, even if you wanted to just riff on something for a little bit. Yeah, okay. Um, let me just pull up a sound. I'll, uh, I've been talking about how amazing Keith Nolan is. Now I want people to hear how badass this guy is. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me see. Uh, uh, oh, uh, are you there? I'm here. Uh, sorry, let me see where our uh, video is. Sorry, I totally put you on the spot. Oh, I know that okay, I see, I see. we didn't plan that, but okay. I uh, uh um, okay, this is a, a tune called What's Coming Next, and okay. we've just been working on it. Uh, my friend Charlie literally the other day put some baritone and sax on it, and um. It's just a little groove. I'll play not all of it, just a little bit quick because uh now someone tell me something of something I don't know. I'm just trying to keep the wolves from knocking on my door. Baby, I said what? I said what? Now what's coming next? What's coming next, baby? Kind of goes like that. Love it, man. Uh, that that uh, your accent, your accent <laughs> disappears when you sing that, man. That uh, I can yeah. hear a little Harry Connick, uh, Nolan's vibe right there. Yeah, thank you. Love it, man. God, I just so, uh, yeah. I miss it. It makes, makes you feel good. You know, I, I tell people all the time when they say, "Oh, why, why do you play blues?" I, well, I play and write a lot of stuff, but when I when I play blues, it just makes me feel good, and it's the only music that I, that rewards you for yeah. playing it. Right. You know? It does, yeah. man. So, God, you got, you got a gift. Yeah, I, yeah. I forgot what a great voice you have, too, man. But, uh, I am. Um, uh, so that one's called "What's Coming Next." Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, have, um, I have one ballad. If anybody's interested, um, on Spotify and uh, YouTube, it's called "Pardon Me for Asking." Okay. So it's it's not on the album. I released it as a single, just on. Um, 
do me do me a favor um d- direct message me private message me that link and i'll post it in an archive here so that people can go out and check it out on spotify is that cool yeah it's very cool yeah it'd be great Man. so um yeah so, what a uh, gift i uh yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know really man i appreciate you doing that on the spot i i think um you know it's unfortunate right that we're dealing with this pandemic but there are some really positive things that came out of it. You talked about being able to hustle and really put your life back together and be able to pivot, find ways to overcome adversity and find new ways to be able to uh, to go out and, and forge a path for yourself. But had this not happened, there's no way that I would have been able to uh, spend an hour with you and just catch up and, and see your smiling face, you know? Yeah, I, I know. And these are the, unfortunately, these are the, um, these are the good things that come out of it for yeah. For whatever reasons, and it, it really is bad. And um, a lot of people are not as fortunate; they've lost everything, you know. Right. Um, and I think the world's got to wake up as well. There's, you know, musicians, artists, everybody's out of work. The sound engineers, uh, camera camera people, lighting uh, professionals, uh, graphic designers, the people who make the posters, the printing houses. Everybody's bad. I understand that it's a pandemic, but you know, when you come to a musician. Um, there's much less awareness, you know, um, because people just see you on stage or whatever. Right. But, um, I have I have friends and here overseas, and and you know everything has stopped, and yeah. they, they might have to sell some of the most precious instruments or things they have to make a living with. Right. Just to eat, because when the when COVID started and lockdown started. Literally, they had some had no money the next day, let alone the next month. Right. Some have other incomes to to keep them going till till we get through it. So, um, you know, I have to say, Thai people are extremely generous in, when it comes to helping each other out. You know, um, they always share food or make sure you have food or you have. So it's it's really special in, in that way, and um, yeah, it, it's beautiful. Well, you know, it is a reminder to everyone, I think, that it's because it affects every single person on the planet that we have to stand together. You know, we got to take care of each other and and yeah. be kind and, and good to each other, like across the board. You know, there's a lot. Yeah, I mean, you've seen this in Ireland. You've seen it everywhere right now. The, the political unrest that's happening in, in the United States is uh, it's wow. um, it's destructive. And I I see less people banding together and more people forging apart. And when you and I can look across the, the, the screen from each other all the way on the other side of the planet and yeah. talk about commonalities. And I, I would love that other people that can do that across the political aisles or, you know, any kind of other divide. And I, yeah. uh, I, I'm glad I, you- I hope so, um, because there's a great danger because the music culture, um, which employs, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of people, is an industry, but people kind of don't see it as an industry because it's creative, right. you know. And um, but it's it's a it's a billion dollar industry. Right. All the hotels, all, all of the entertainment venues, all the concert venues, everything that goes with it. And if people can't survive um, because our margins are so low and things are so expensive and people are paying so much tax, they have no reserves just to stay afloat for maybe three six months. If the music venues, uh, concert venues, or the production companies literally go out of business what happens to culture who's going to go and visit a city a bangkok city when you've got no live music venues right right people don't go to thailand or or france to stay in a a hotel and sit in the lobby right they go to experience the city and its inhabitants and all it's uh, all it's got to offer so people come and live in these cities people invest in their time and effort and their talents in businesses and they grow them and you know musicians go and play with them light and sound technicians go and work in them and right. people, people make really cool posters and do social media advertising and so it's a you know it's a big thing and, and that's in in a great danger of, of um breaking you know and um i know several venues won't, won't reopen because right. they're open, you know and i saw pizza hut in the states has filed for bankruptcy oh. i'm not out of business already in the states we could you know, do with less Pizza Huts and more uh, music venues. You know, <laughs> really, I do worry a lot about our local music venues. And yesterday I had uh, one of the booking agents that works in this. I live in Portland, Oregon. 
um, and he works with a ton of bands and um, we were working on putting together a show uh, on this show with a bunch of independent music coalition uh, members so that we can talk about ways to support the venues because if the venues don't come back the musicians have nowhere to play you know so um, that's the next step but uh, I think um, awareness just you know the fact that you're talking about the awareness about uh, you know all the different components it's not just the people that are on stage but are all the peripheral people as well and uh, you know um, the ways to be able to support those those people as people that appreciate and understand the culture go out and find their Spotify page and, and like, and support them and download a track. And um, like I said, you know um, what we can do to take care of each other is uh, the most important thing at this point. And that's what I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that uh, maybe somebody in, uh, uh, you know, Louisiana saw Keith Nolan on here and said, man, you know what, when we open up after this pandemic, I need to get that guy down here playing a little bit of Delta <laughs> blues, you know, and uh, well, that'd, I, uh, be, that'd be nice yeah, well, I want you over on on this continent for a little bit. Have you toured the states at all? No, I've never been. I've never been. So um, you've never been in the states at all. That's on my. It's on my uh, list of things to do. But I've never made it over to the states. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, I played with some American artists. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I've, it's always been on 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 this side of the world. So I've ne- I've never actually gone there. And um, every, every time I've kind of thought about it and said, oh, I should. Uh, buy a plane ticket and go, go go to New Orleans or go to Chicago or go to New York or to Texas um, and see some of the and hear some of the musicians I've always wanted to hear live. Um, I've always been busy or doing something or moving sure. or caught up in re, re, re building something or touring or and you didn't have time myself and so yeah. One day yeah, one day. This is not the time to come. Not right now, man. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> not just because of the pandemic, man. This is not the time to be in the States. But I uh, I think, um, you know, there will be time. And when it's time, you are more than welcome, man. I can't wait to have you over here. I, I, show I, you around. I, I very much look forward to that. Yeah, it would be great to hang and show me around and play some music with you again. You got it, man. We'll, we'll hop on stage someplace, whether we're invited or not. <laughs> so... I uh, don't forget to send me that link to uh, um, the Spotify ballad and uh, folks, if you're able check out Keith Nolan, go ahead his uh, Facebook and his Instagram and uh, Spotify pages. And uh, and do you have a a Keith Nolan.com or is is there some website out there? Uh, Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a YouTube channel, Keith Nolan uh, music. Um, Yeah. And just, or just search Keith Nolan on Spotify, Keith Nolan music or whatever on YouTube. There's there's a bunch of uh, videos from gigs like with my band and there's a bunch of tracks like Pardon Me For Asking and some other that are out there. That's great, man. You want to play me 30 seconds more just to play me something out, something funky? Yeah, something funky. Yeah, okay. Um, Let me see. Yeah, okay. Uh, Maybe I'll uh, use something... I think we jammed superstitious, didn't we, when we were in there? Oh, superstition, yeah. Um, okay, superstition. Let me just give you get a old classic, pull up an old funky club. There we go. There we go. I wish, I've taken to playing club a lot and um, <coughs> um, putting a wow, wow on it, like, a, like an effect, you know, it's all simple. That's so badass, man. I love it. I love it. You are the king, Keith Nolan, ladies and gentlemen, all the way from Bangkok, Thailand. This guy woke up early just to hang out with us, man. <laughs> How was that? I, uh, I, uh, I, I really, uh, I pray that you're healthy and that uh, this, uh, this. Oh, you mentioned right now, you guys are in a good, good space where the, the, uh, the, the cases are down. So let's uh, just. We have no new cases in about 30, 33 days or 34 days. Um, the weather's beautiful. The shops are open again. Uh, no live music yet. No clubs. Yeah. Uh, no big social gatherings. Sure. I, I think that's coming uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, hopefully. 
and so there isn't that part of it. But we've had no deaths, thank God, in uh, in about thirty days, thirty three oh, days. Amazing. And um, very, very, very few cases of of COVID, but no deaths, and we're in a very good place. I think we're very lucky, actually, that um, the figures are what they are here, as opposed to what we're seeing in. Uh, countries in the region, Europe and, and the States. And yeah, no, I don't know that it's luck. I think that you guys are doing the right things to take care of it. So uh, if you're here in the States or anywhere else, just be safe, wear the mask and stay inside. And as long as you can, man, we need to take care of these people and get this thing out of here so we can go back to living, right? Well, um, <laughs> yeah. That's um, I, thank you so much, my friend. I am really glad to see you again. And uh, Brian Abrams, thanks for introducing me to this wonderful cat. I uh, I, I love seeing your space. Well, yeah, uh, you We'll, we'll catch up soon enough. And th- thanks so much for, uh, for the interview and chatting and having me on your show. It's awesome. My, my pleasure. I miss you, buddy. Have a beautiful week, okay? Thanks, man.